my approach is to take our everyday experience of money and go from there into the system and hopefully by doing that to show people there are chronic endemic problems in the system. So where does our money come from? That's a good question to start with. And our money is, um, for all intents and purposes, our medium of exchange. We buy and sell stuff and we earn it, save it, lend it and so on. And it comes in two forms as far as we, the users, are concerned. Physical cash, stuff in your pocket, your wallet, um, still quite widely used for pubs, corner shops, small everyday p purchases. Um, however, the business, the economy is conducted using electronic computer money, the digits that jump from one bank account to another. So stuff is bought and sold and so on. Um, so these money numbers, as we might think of them, these numbers within the bank's computers, are our medium of exchange. It's what we use um, to run our economy. And in that sense, they are our money, our money supply. So the question then arises, how do they come into being? Where do they come from? How do they get into the computers? Um, how do they originate? And most people in this room know the answer to that, but uh, let's have a look. First of all, we need some terminology. We need to start thinking like accountants. Um, and two good concepts we need are assets and liabilities. I find this approach better than thinking of money flows, because um, that's a bit of an anachronism from when money was stuff and it used to actually physically move. All that change, changes now are the numbers. Some go up and some go down, and let's see how that works. So assets and liabilities. Well, an asset, in our context, we're talking about monetary assets. And obviously, you know, your family is an asset to you, but we're, we're narrowing down monetary um, stuff of value. And can be property, but it also can be bonds or debts, other people's obligations to pay you money at some time in the future. Conversely, on the other side of that equation, there's liabilities, and that's something which is going to cost you. You have an obligation to somebody else, perhaps, to pay them money back at some time. So if I borrow money from you, then there's a dual aspect to that debt. It's my liability because I owe you, and it's your asset because you have a claim on me in the future. Now, the same contract relationship exists between banks and their customers, their clients, both borrowers and depositors. So, let's say I've got a mortgage with a bank, I'm a debtor to the bank, I owe to the bank, then that debt is, of course, my liability, but it's also the bank's asset. The bank treats it as a, a piece of wealth, something of value to the bank. The other side, my money in the bank, you log into your bank account and you, know, you maybe have a few hundred, a few thousand, and you feel good about that, that's my money, there it is. Um, well, that's not quite how it is. It's, again, a contract, a debt contract between you and the bank. This time, it's the bank's liability. They um, might need to hand over some real money to you if you come into the bank and demand it. And it's your asset. Um, so because you've put your money in the bank, what's actually gone on uh, in law, in contract, is that you've lent it to the bank. And the bank now has use of it not your cash anymore. So try to think in terms of assets, liabilities and contracts between parties. Oh. Um, and my approach is to, within this way of thinking, just to look at everyday transactions and try and build up a picture of how these numbers change within the system. So we look at um, what's called the bank's balance sheet, and we'll go on to that in the next slide. What is a balance sheet? Oh, it's just an accounting convention where you list 
on one side of the paper, on one side of the computer screen, all the assets of an entity, and on the other side, all its liabilities. And um, double entry bookkeeping is a way of maintaining um, exact balance between these two sides. We'll see that. So then we see how these money numbers change for each basic operation, putting money in, taking it out, transactions, moving it from one account to another. And you can see then from this bottom-up approach, going from the um, particular to the general, from the detail to the more global picture, that emergent properties of the whole system um, are revealed as chronic problems. Okay. An initial balance sheet. A bunch of people get together and get hold of a banking license and join the game. This is their initial balance sheet. Um, their assets start off as all the money that the investors put in as shareholders. That goes to an account at the Bank of England. On the other side of the sheet, this is a, a little more subtle, um, this is a a liability to the bank as an entity which has a debt to its shareholders. So conceptually you have to separate the shareholders from the entity which is the bank itself. And the initial liability of the bank is what's called the shareholders capital account. It's um, how much the bank sort of owes back to the shareholders should it be wound up. So if the bank ceases to exist, the shareholders have this claim on the assets of the bank. Therefore, it's a liability of the bank, an asset to the shareholders. Right, well, that's the initial balance sheet. How does that balance sheet change when somebody comes along to the bank and wants uh, a loan, a £100,000 mortgage, say? Let's have a look at that balance sheet, how it changes in terms of the assets and liabilities. Because remember all the balance sheet is as, as a snapshot of the current state of play of the bank. What it's, uh, how its assets and liabilities change over time. So here's an event, a basic event. Somebody takes out a mortgage. What happens to the balance sheet? Well, very schematically this. Um, the Banks' assets go up 100,000 because this person who walked in the door now owes the bank 100,000 pounds, which wasn't owed to the bank before. So the bank's got 100,000 pounds extra assets to what it had before the event. How is that balanced? Well, the borrower, the person who took out the loan, has 100,000 pounds in his current account. Actually probably has gone to his solicitor's current account in practice, but it is a liability to the banking system. When we, we're just pretending to look at one bank as though everything's happening in one bank, but conceptually that's uh, okay if you think of it as the whole banking system. Obviously you might borrow from one bank and deposit it in another, but uh, with a combined view of the multiple balance sheets of the banks, you can represent it schematically as this. So what's happened here is that somebody in the bank has approved a loan and has just typed in £100,000 onto the asset side of the bank's um, balance sheet, however that's represented in the computers, and has typed in £100,000 into the current account of whoever's going to receive the money. There's no stuff has moved, two numbers have changed. That's it. So we can say that debt and money are birth twins. They come into existence together. When a new loan is made, the debt and the money come into being in equal measure on opposite sides of the balance sheet. So the balance sheet is expanded in tandem. New accounting entries of debt numbers and money numbers. Um, you've got a lot of debate on the internet and so on. Um, the official view is that the bank isn't sort of moving any money, it's extending credit. Well, you can look at it that way, but in a pragmatic sense, as money users, we've got these numbers 
We just borrowed them from the bank. New numbers have sprung up in our account and we can spend them. They're perfectly good. Um, in a strong sense, they are money. Um, they are a medium of exchange. Um, ask yourself, what's in your bank account? I got, got that from that advert was going around at the time, what's in your wallet? 